this bizarre view of the human condition. However, psychology has paid a heavy methodological price. This is why Nortranders writes that cognitive science is not particularly concerned with the unconscious. It attempts to understand which logical rules and algorithms are needed in order to describe the human mind. It assumes that there are clear logical rules, not incomprehensible quantities of unconscious calculation. Closer to our own times is uh, the work of Macha Toka, who wrote a book called The Unconscious and Social Relations, 1964. Uh, the distinction that Pearls and Hefferlein and Goodman make between what they call figure and ground, Gedlin's discussion of fringe and focusing, the distinction Schifrin and Schneider make between automatic and controlled information processing, uh, Smith's notion of pre-storage and computation, Sellers' discussion of different types of inferences, uh, Naser's ideas on non-pictorial imagery. I am not arguing here that all the above researchers were and still are grappling with exactly the same problem. However, the research agendas of those cited demonstrate enough family resemblances to the conscious versus cognition problem to suggest that in their own ways they were grappling with a very similar issue. After an explicit recognition of interiority in the 17th century, it would take several uh, centuries of mystified thinking until we realized that the introspectable space we call conscious interiority was not the mind in its totality, but only a small chamber of a much larger edifice. And the visibility and, and a spatiality of depth characterized this grand structure with its unknown palatial halls, concealed quarters, and hidden rooms connected by secret passages that lead to even deeper unexplored caverns. It is on these spaces that the socio-psychological foundations of the human condition stand. And yet, strangely, despite all the evidence for non-conscious cognition, to quote another observer, researchers have been made to jump through methodological hoops to establish non-consciousness beyond any reasonable doubt. In order to make the centrality of non-conscious mental processes more clear, I suggest we discard the conventional Cartesian mind-body duality and replace it with a more fruitful triunity of one, conscious mind, two, non-conscious mind, and three, body. Along with this, we should discard the dualistic spatial metaphor of inner and outer and employ the visual trope of one, introspectable, mental processes or interiority as witnessed by the mind's eye, two, invisible mental processes, non-conscious cognition, and three, the visible world, which includes our body and the environment. Recent work in cognitive science strongly supports the premise that most thinking is done non-consciously. By recognizing a third element, invisible mental processes, an entire world of encyclopedic knowledge and complicated processes are acknowledged that accounts for the tremendous amount of labor going on within our minds. These invisible mental processes also account for the apparent automaticity, spontaneity, and unthinkingness of much of our actions. The most common and misleading understanding is that introspection is some type of mental mirror that copies what we perceive. Equating conscious interiority with perception, as if interiority merely mirrored bodily sensations, is the fourth barrier. The perception theory of interiority is the most obstinate, commonly held, and entrenched view of the nature of psyche. It is important to argue not that this theory is sort of wrong. Rather, this theory is wrong in the most fundamental sense. There is something very commonsensical about the belief that interiority is perceptual experience and confusing introspectable consciousness with, with what we perceive has puzzled thinkers for centuries. It is, however, easy to demonstrate that the two are very different. That interiority does not reflect the outside world is clear since, to quote Jaynes, you can consciously re what you can consciously recall is a thimbleful to the huge oceans of your actual knowledge. Our introspection only reflects a very limited portion of our perceptual bodily experiences. Moreover, people, quote, are not conscious of very much of what they sense. People are not conscious of very much of what they think. People are not conscious of very much of what they do. The very language we use to describe psychophysiological processes requires an overhaul. Let us avoid confusion by labeling non-conscious cognition reactivity, the way Jaynes did, rather than perception. Reactivity includes, to quote Jaynes, all stimuli my behavior takes into account of in any way. 
while consciousness is something quite distinct and a far less ubiquitous phenomenon. We are conscious of what we are reacting to only from time to time. Remarkably, to quote uh, another observer, an astonishing number of textbooks in physiology and neuropsychology fail to mention this. An understanding of reactivity allows us to see through the illusions of conscious interiority. To quote another observer, we experience sensation but do not experience that this sensation has been interpreted and processed. The processing is a task of non-consciousness. People experience far more than what they consciously register. An example of reactivity is proprioception, or the largely non-conscious sense of where one's body parts are in space. Of course, its impairment is related to the loss of body sense, or body ego. The fifth barrier concerns ignoring anonymous psychological behaviors such as hypnosis, spiritualist mediums, automatic writing, glossolalia, spirit possession, and poetic and religious frenzy. Though anthropology and ethnology have explored these fascinating phenomena, they need to be incorporated into mainstream psychology in a more robust theoretical manner. I want to conclude with the final barrier, which concerns ignoring history, or some of us do, as a source of evidence, insights, and leads for appreciating the psychic diversity and psychic plasticity of the human condition. This last barrier actually returns us to the first barrier, barrier, or the lack of amazement at the existence of conscious interiority. Through a careful reading of psychohistory, we can come to see just how profound the transformation of the human condition has been. The need for historically informed and culturally sensitive psychology cannot be overemphasized. Culture has the effect and impact of evolution minus genetic mutation. If we understand the significance and role of interiority, then we will also understand that Homo sapiens is the only species that can evolve without major alterations in its physical nature. This virtual evolution is possible because of culture or extragenetic information. And interiority is a specific development of human culture. I think I'll end there. Thank you very much.